to the session on coronavirus, need to know legal advice with the Greater Birmingham Chambers of Commerce. I'm Raj Kandola, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. Now, as the coronavirus crisis has uh, enveloped society, the myriad of legal complexity has also become more apparent. And I'm delighted to say that we're joined by Claire Francis, partner at Pinsent Masons, to untangle some of these issues and to clarify what it means for the business community. Um, so in terms of an agenda for today's session, what we'll tend to do is I'll start by focusing on our Keep Business Moving campaign. Um, we'll then hand over to Claire to run through a set of slides. Uh, that should take us through half past 11. And then we'll have a Q&A session for around 15 minutes. So if you'd like to ask any questions at any point, write them down in the chat box on the right hand side and I can ask them on your behalf during the Q&A. Now, I've just seen that one person has said that they can't hear. So if you do have any technical difficulties, um, one thing you can try and do is log out of Click Meeting and log back in. And if that's not working, then please consult the Click Meeting troubleshooting Q&A in the first instance. And my colleague in our marketing team will also be on hand to answer any questions um, if you do face any further difficulties. So just before I hand over to Claire, just as a reminder, uh, for those of you not familiar with it, our Keep Business Moving campaign um, is uh, obviously set up to support uh, the wider business community during this very difficult campaign. And the three strands very much mirror the raison d'etre of the chamber itself. So we're looking to connect. So looking to connect with fellow local businesses through our hashtag GB Chamber Chat, which takes place every weekday between 11 a.m. and 12 p.m. on Twitter. We still have our member to member offers as well. So please do check those out in terms of uh, support. Well, we've still got our coronavirus hub, which has a, a raft of information on how um, the support functions which are out there for businesses right now. We're holding a number of informative webinars such as this one. We still have our free legal and HR helpline, but we're also undertaking uh, lots of lobbying and campaign activity as well with both local and national stakeholders. So if you are facing any difficulties, uh, which you'd like us to highlight to both local and national stakeholders, then please do provide us a case study and you'll see the link on the, the slide. But we're also supporting government appeals as well uh, for sourcing ventilators, hand sanitizer and protective clothing. And that's a campaign which will, I think, take uh, precedence over the next couple of weeks. And also growing awareness of your business. So we still want to hear about thought leadership content. So if you've got blog posts and videos and tips to respond to COVID-19 or working digitally, then please do let us know. And of course, we have our Chamberlink daily articles as well, which showcase your business latest news and initiatives responding to the crisis. Um, so if you'd like any further information, do visit the, uh, the site, as you can see at the bottom, uh, www.greaterbirminghamchambers.com forward slash coronavirus. I mentioned some of the informative webinars. We have a series next week as well, as you can see on the screen, uh, one about furloughing and planning for the future. Uh, next Wednesday is about marketing your business through lockdown. Uh, we also have one on Thursday around protecting your business from fraud during the coronavirus, and one on Friday around um, tactical tips for maximizing short-term clash flow. So if you'd like any further information on any of those events, please again do visit our website and view the events section. Without any further delay, I'll hand over to Claire. Claire, over to you. Um, so as Marge said, today we're going to look at some of the need to know legal advice areas um, related to coronavirus. There's obviously quite a broad variety of different topics. So for the purposes of today's webinar, we're focusing on, on the following areas. We'll have a look at force majeure and frustration, um, which is very relevant to contracts. Some of the advice around business closure and what you should and shouldn't be doing in your businesses. Some corporate considerations. Um, some information around the wrongful trading and directors' duties obligations, and then also a brief look at the government support schemes available. Um, today, we're not going to cover employment issues around furloughing and the coronavirus job retention scheme in any detail, as there was a separate webinar on that yesterday, which is available on the Chamber of Commerce YouTube channel for anyone who needs inf more information on that. So kicking off with force majeure, often referred to as one of the boilerplate clauses in contracts and effectively bolted onto the main clauses, usually without detailed consideration. However, in with the recent COVID-19 pandemic, then force majeure clauses are becoming under a lot more scrutiny. And what's really important to remember is that force majeure is essentially a contractual right and obligation, which is only available if the contract specifically sets this out. 
And it normally operates so that the party affected by the force majeure event is relieved from some of its obligations under the contract, usually excused performance. As I say, it's not implied, so must be specified within the contract. And it's very specific, therefore, as to exactly how it is drafted as to the relief you might get. Um, sometimes it could be just excused performance. It might be an, in, an entitlement to an extension of time. And in some, char some cases, you might be entitled to additional charges or money as a result. If there's no express contractual provision, then there is no common law equivalent implied. So then you'd be left to rely on frustration, which we will look at in a little bit more detail later. But firstly, picking up on the detail of force majeure clauses themselves, we've put together this guide to help you when looking at your contracts to identify whether or not the force majeure clause might be relevant in the instance of COVID-19. So there are four key areas to look for. First of all is what is the trigger event in the drafting itself? So does it refer to things like disease, epidemic, pandemic? Um, if it does refer to any of those, then as, as a lot of you will be aware, the World Health Organization has declared COVID-19 as a pandemic. So if it refers to one of those things, then that's your first um, tick done in that you will fall within the scope of your force majeure clause. If it doesn't refer to that, then it's important to look at what the other trigger events are. And some of the common ones are things like acts of government um, or shortage of labour. And certainly with the COVID-19 pandemic as it currently sits, it's likely that these will be triggered. We have seen significant acts of government in terms of the lockdown and how that might affect contracts. And also you may be experiencing shortages of labour due to high sickness absence or people being required to self-isolate. If it doesn't list any of these, then a lot of force majeure clauses do also rely on events that are just beyond the reasonable control of the parties. And again, it is commonly accepted that COVID-19 would fall within this remit. So it's quite broad and actually it will trigger a lot of force majeure clauses unless they are very specific and only list certain trigger events. So once you've checked whether it's in the trigger event, the next important thing is to think about the standard of proof that's required. And typically under contracts, we'll see um, something like hindered, prevented, delayed or disrupted. And it's important to ascertain whether or not any of those things have actually occurred. So, for example, if your contract talks about prevented, it literally has to be impossible for you to perform that contract, which is a very high bar. Whereas if it talks about delayed or disrupted, then this is a lower bar and probably easier to evidence for you. The burden on proving whether or not um, you fall within the remit of the force majeure is on the party seeking to rely on that clause. So if you're the supplier seeking to um, obtain force majeure relief, it's your responsibility to prove that the trigger event has occurred and that you've met that standard of proof in terms of the impact on your business. So once you've got over those hurdles, then it's looking at the notification requirements in the contract. And these can be really critical. Quite a lot of force majeure clauses will say if you do not comply with those notice requirements to the letter, then you will be forfeiting the relief that comes with those. So it's important to look at these carefully in terms of the technical requirements and also the timelines. For example, you may be required to notify within a certain number of days of the force majeure event occurring. So it's critical you make sure you meet those timelines and don't lose your remedy as a result. Finally, some other watch points to look out for in that clause. Are there any obligations on you to mitigate the loss? And, and if so, it's important to think about how you might do that in the context of COVID-19. It's slightly different to many of the force majeure events that we see in that actually there may be limited circumstances in which you can mitigate the impact. It might not be possible to uh, seek an alternative supplier, for example, because fundamentally everyone is in the same boat in relation to it and, and on a global basis. A critical one will also be, is there a termination backstop? So many contracts will say if a force majeure event pervades for more than 30 days, then there is a right to terminate the contract. So when claiming force majeure, it's important to have this diarised so you don't miss this date. A, if you want to exercise it yourselves, but also B, to make sure that the other party then doesn't use that as a right to get out of the contract for some other reason and leave you without that contract on an ongoing basis after the COVID-19 um, pandemic has finished. And finally, what are the corresponding payment obligations? 
Typically, it will be difficult for a customer to claim that they are unable to pay due to force majeure. As things currently stand, the banks are open. They probably can physically pay. Um, they may just not want to because they're not receiving the service. But it's important to look at what the contract says about these corresponding obligations and make sure that that is taken into account in any decisions you are making. So as I said, uh, force majeure isn't implied in contracts. So therefore, if your contract doesn't have a specific force majeure clause, you are left looking at whether the remedy of frustration applies. Now, frustration covers a situation where parties have contractually agreed um, what will happen if a particular event occurs. Um, and if, if the contract covers that, you cannot have frustration as a remedy. It is there as a remedy of last resort if there is nothing in the contract. It can apply if there is an unforeseen event um, after the contract is entered into, which was not due to the fault of either party, but it must make performance impossible to perform or transform performance into something which is radically different, not just more expensive or more difficult to what the contract envisaged. And as I say, the contract can't include a clause which gives any other form of remedy. On this basis, frustration is a really high bar to be able to claim. And it will definitely be harder for any contracts that are rented into after the initial outbreak in China. For performance to be prevented in this way, um, you are going to need to be really significantly impacted. And therefore, we're seeing very, very few cases where frustration is actually going to be a practical remedy that will help businesses in this situation. So just looking at the difference between the two, the doctrine of frustration is so narrow, it may exceptionally apply in some COVID-19 um, instances. Certainly, it's difficult to see where it will apply uh, as at the moment. And based on previous case law, it's such a narrow, narrow circumstance that if you're thinking about trying to rely on that, then I would certainly suggest getting some legal advice before writing to your customer or supplier. Um, what we have done is include a link on the slide to an online guide we've got across force majeure and frustration and you're able to go to that anytime it's on our website and we're keeping it up to date as we go through the pandemic and you can use that to look back and, and refresh your memory on what the trigger events are and what the key points are to look out for as a more detailed guide going forward in the future and you're all welcome to access that link so moving on to look at business closures. So on the 23rd of March, the government announced much stri stricter lockdown measures. Um, this included restrictions on people leaving their homes, but also the Prime Minister announced the closure of all shops selling non-essential goods, such as clothes and electronics, the closure of many other facilities like libraries and sports centres, the ban on gatherings of more than two people in public, and the closure of restaurants, pubs and bars. What is important to remember, and there's been a lot of confusion around this, particularly in the construction sector, is that the businesses listed in the guidance must close, save for certain exceptions. However, all other businesses that aren't listed in that guidance are, are able to stay open and trade. However, in doing so, those businesses need to be very mindful of certain obligations. So firstly, anyone that can work from home must work from home. So for example, a law firm is entitled to stay open, but the vast majority of our staff can work from home, so they must work from home in order to do so. For other businesses where people cannot work from home, so for example, it could be um, a warehouse or distribution business, then the people that need to be in that office in order to operate that business can go to work. However, the business must comply with Public Health England guidance in keeping open. And this can cause some practical challenges because this is where you need to ensure social distancing measures are complied with in the workplace. So everyone should work and operate two metres apart. Um, you should also comply with all the other PHE guidance around having suitable hand washing and sanitisation facilities available throughout the premises. And this can make it quite impractical and therefore many businesses have chosen to close for a short period in any event um, for employee well-being as well as the practicalities around continuing to keep that business open. But it is important to remember you can remain open and have critical staff in should you need to. 
um, provided you're not on that list of um, shops that the Prime Minister said must close or, or facilities that must close. In those health and safety obligations, your responsibility is not just to your staff, but it's on the whole workplace environment. And therefore, if you remain open, you must also ensure that you are putting in place relevant procedures in order to keep safe contractors, customers, and to the extent required, the public as well. Um, and this is really critical. So if you are keeping your business open, it's important you have documented how you intend to comply with health and safety procedures how you will um, deal with your employees. So for example, if they need to work from home, is that possible in their contract or, or indeed work from somewhere else? And what employment law changes might there be there? And obviously there is the furloughing scheme for those that can't. It's important to think through your supply chain commitments. For example, if you need your suppliers to deliver uh, less raw materials, actually is that permitted under the contract or are there minimum volumes that you'll need to renegotiate with those suppliers in order to make that work. We'd also suggest you notify your insurers. Um, there may be business interruption insurance available and it's important to maintain an open dialogue with your insurers so that you again don't lose the right to claim that at the relevant time. Um, there are additional reliefs and we'll look at some of the government measures um, later. And again, it was worth thinking those through. So, for example, business rates relief. And finally, we, whether you stay open or close, the director's duties are really important to consider. And we'll look at those in a bit more detail later. So moving on to some of the um, corporate considerations that you, you might need to be taking during this period. Something quite simple, actually, what do you do with your AGM? Um, what are the options available to you if your AGM is coming up or is in the next couple of months, as many, many companies are as they go through year ends that align with the tax year? So if your notice has gone out, you need to think about can you postpone the AGM and, and what rights do your articles give you to do that? And in doing so, definitely check the availability of the AGM venue. Many venues that would, would previously hold AGMs are closing for longer periods and you just need to work out when they will be open. If your notice hasn't gone out, then I would think about delaying your AGM um, to, a, to a future period and, and keeping that under constant review at this time as to when you think the lockdown uh, may be lifted. We have been asked by a number of businesses whether it's possible to hold virtual AGMs um, and to use a hold them using technology such as this. Certainly under current legislation, virtual AGMs are challenging and, and difficult to hold unless you have a specific right within your articles of association, which most companies don't. However, we have um, on page 60 of some government guidance, it was indicated they will uh, have future legislation to enable virtual AGMs. Now that hasn't come through as yet and Parliament obviously doesn't sit again now until the 21st of April. We have been informed informally that we expect that legislation to come through shortly after that and to come into effect in May time in order to relax the Companies Act provisions so that you would be able to hold a virtual AGM. So definitely if you can postpone your AGM uh, without causing you difficulty under your articles until that later date, that may be an option that becomes available at that point in time. So definitely keep it under review. The other issues for boardrooms are thinking about can you file your accounts on time and, and what does the audit process look like? Um, so Companies House has um, introduced a scheme for companies to seek a three month extension to their filing requirements. So again, if your deadlines are coming up soon and you're going to be challenged to, to do that and get them audited without qualified accounts, then think about applying for that extension under the scheme. Um, there are There is ongoing updated guidance around financial disclosures and what companies should be doing in that respect. And again, some of that gives you longer time to make those financial disclosures. So if you have deadlines coming up, do think about what relief you can get. And finally, there are some real practicalities. If you are continuing to trade, how do you physically get documents signed um, and how do you continue to transact your business? So certainly from an electronic signature perspective, um, legally the print sign and, and scan route will still be perfectly valid for most uh, normal contracts that aren't deeds and you can use that without a problem. 
Obviously, many people don't have printing facilities at home, though, so electronic signatures are being looked at in more detail. And we are in dialogue with the Law Society as to how they can relax some of the electronic signature um, requirements in order to enable transactions to continue to go ahead. And it's something they're keeping under constant review. In the meantime, you can use um, PDF software in order to create a PDF signature and incorporate that. And that, again, works perfectly fine for simple contracts. Or many law firms um, and other advisors have e-signature platforms such as DocuSign, which will enable you to complete transactions without any difficulty as you go forward. So moving on to look at uh, regulatory issues and wrongful trading, many businesses are concerned about the severe financial strain that is being placed on them. Uh, companies that have never ever considered solvency to be an issue are reassessing that position. And for directors of organisations, this brings it into sharp focus. So from a UK company law perspective, it requires directors to act in a way which is most likely to promote the success of the company for the benefit of your shareholders. That changes slightly if you're in financial difficulty, as the duty is replaced by an obligation to act in the best interest of the creditors of the company, and the duty to shareholders effectively evaporates. In practice, that means the directors must also ensure the interests of creditors as a class of a whole are protected as far as possible. It doesn't mean you need to stop trading. Indeed, sometimes that's probably not in the interest of creditors. So what to do will depend on the circumstances of the business, but you do need to be very mindful of that and make sure you are considering those provisions. That said, there has been a limited uh, relaxation of directors' duties and the sanctions against individuals. And in particular, the wrongful trading provisions have been suspended for three months from the 1st of March 2020. Now, these are the provisions that render directors liable for a proportion of the company's debts if they permit a business to continue to trade when there's no reasonable prospect of the company avoiding insolvent liquidation. So this does give some relief, but um, it's a, not an opportunity to, to forget considering these because there will still be fiduciary duties um, that you need to think about, but it does remove the wrongful trading um, obligations for that period to give businesses a little bit more flexibility in how they trade through this challenging period. It's also worth bearing in mind um, directors and officers insurance and that won't automatically provide a respite in these situations so particular care needs to be taken um, and particularly where you have a group of companies because each of the directors will have separate responsibilities and duties to the individual companies. And it's important to bear that in mind as you're trading through so that you make sure you have um, discharged those duties to each individual company in the group, which may have different creditors and therefore different responsibilities that sit upon you. So finally, I just wanted to look at very briefly some of the business support mechanisms that are available. Um, the government has introduced quite a wide package of relief in order to support businesses. It recognises that cash is critical at this time and it is really challenging for a lot of people. And it also recognises that COVID-19 is um, hopefully a short term issue. And when we come out the other side, it wants businesses to remain strong and to be able to continue to trade going through that. I've listed some of the major uh, schemes on the slide and I'll just run through some of those. But it's I will also say that on the next slide, I've included two links for you, um, which go through to articles on our website, which um, set out a table for each of the business schemes including eligibility criteria and where to go to apply so that it's all in one place and a separate article which goes into more detail on the coronavirus job retention scheme which again you'll be able to access at any time. So one of the larger schemes is the corporate financing facility. Um, this is a facility, a Bank of England new lending facility as a credit easing scheme and is essentially aimed at addressing disruption to cash flow for companies as a result of COVID-19. It is a financing loan scheme um, which is run by the Bank of England and it has some challenges around needing a credit rating to apply for that. So it tends to be aimed at larger firms. 
Um, there is a business rates holiday for businesses in the retail, hospitality and leisure sectors, which means that we know business rates in England for the 2020-21 tax year. This applies equally to both large and small businesses, so it is available. There is also a scheme where local authorities can provide additional funding to support businesses that pay little or no business rates. And these are sometimes by way of grant. Um, so it's important to think about those and, and whether you could be eligible for some of those because you will need to apply for them. Next one up is the much talked about coronavirus business interruption loan scheme. So this is um, essentially a loan scheme where the government guarantees the loan. And originally this was just released for small and medium businesses, um, but the government has now replicated it with a coronavirus business interruption, large business loan scheme on the same sort of terms. So again, that has expanded the scope of who that is available to. The statutory sick pay scheme um, is some legislation which allows small and medium enterprises to claim statutory sick pay for those employees who are off on sickness absence. And this is open to employers that have less than 250 employees, um, but it does help with the cash flow for paying the statutory sick pay if you have a high rate of staff sickness due to COVID-19. There are also a number of um, general taxation schemes, such as the time to pay scheme introduced by HMRC, which again can help alleviate some of the issues from a cash flow perspective. Um, the coronavirus job retention scheme, as I said, we won't go into that detail today, but at a high level, that enables you to furlough employees um, that you don't need to work and claim up to 80% of their salary, up to £2,500 per month per worker. Um, and that retains them on the books so that they are not made redundant, but you obtain that relief um, and claim it back from the government uh, for the period that they are furloughed. And finally, the government has also now introduced some self-employed income support schemes to support the self-employed, um, whereas the coronavirus job retention scheme only um, supports employees themselves. So as I said, I've included on this slide a couple of links. The top one is to the um, business support mechanisms, which goes through all of them in a lot of detail and gives you the eligibility criteria and how you can apply for them and also links out to the application schemes. We will continually update this. So if new schemes are introduced, they will be posted on that page. And if the eligibility criteria change in any way, then again, they will be posted on that page so that it's all in one space and makes it easy for you to apply to, for them. So that brings us to the end of the, the content at this stage. Um, and now I think we're happy to pick up any questions that may have come through. Claire, that's, uh, that's fantastic. So thank you so much for that. Um, really informative, um, covering lots of different angles there. Um, so just wanted to see if anyone had any initial questions at this stage. Just picking them up now. Okay, um, not as of yet. So I've got a few questions, if it's all right, just to, to run through a couple sure. of them. Yeah? Um, so I've made some notes here. So going back to um, this concept around frustration and force majeure. Mm -hmm. um, so will increased costs be, could increased costs be used to excuse non-performance or delay, for example? So from a force majeure perspective, that very much depends on the wording of the clause. Um, so, for example, if you had increased costs, which led to labour shortage um, and labour shortage is one of the trigger events, then then, yes, that could be used to do it. However, generally, just because it costs you slightly more, you would be required to mitigate your exposure um, and therefore probably continue to perform. So it's quite fact specific. Mm -hmm. Um, but what I would say is if you have increased costs in performing, then there are a number of other areas you should look at in the contract as well. So, for example, is there a price increase clause, um, which is linked to a measure um, that would enable you to increase the price? Um, and also just have an open discussion with your customers. You know, these, these are about ensuring you have long term business relationships after COVID-19 pandemic as well. And it, it's not just about enforcing the terms of the contracts. And certainly we are seeing a large number of businesses. Yes, they want to be aware what their rights are under the contract. But actually, they're looking at this as not just um, enforcing legal rights because 
they recognize it's not anyone's fault. We're in a mm. unique situation as a global business community. And therefore, they are thinking about how they can ha- make sure there is a more long term relationship and trade through this together. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, I also made some notes when you talked about construction companies. Mm. I was hoping we could share some more information on what are the, the legal ramifications um, if a construction site decides to temporarily close because of COVID? Because I presume there's issues around site safety, site security, for example, record keeping. Yeah, so the Construction Leadership Council has issued separate guidance to construction companies uh, and some standard operating procedures that they want construction companies to comply with in order to make sure that they are meeting the Public Health England requirements. And those standard operating procedures go into quite a lot of detail. So if you are in the construction industry, um, it's worth going to look at those and making sure you're complying with them. Um, The CLC is encouraging construction sites that they can remain open. And this has been um, a hot potato, it's fair to say, uh, in terms of employees feeling they are at risk because it is very difficult to socially distance on a construction site and maintain those health and safety requirements. Um, If a site decides it would like to close um, in any event because of employee well-being or because lots of sites are being forced to close because they can't get the materials to operate the site in any event Um, then in doing so it needs to just think through what contracts does it need to pause as well um, so that materials don't continue to arrive at site how can it adequately secure those premises while no one is at site and make sure that the public can't access um, and get injured as a result and also notify insurers so so for things like the business interruption insurance um, so that they could potentially have some um, hedging against that closure period. I think probably one of the biggest issues um, which is still unresolved is if a construction business does decide to close its site how do you decide when to open again? Um, And this is true for any business that's had to close or has its staff working from home. At what point do people decide um, is the exit strategy from this? And again, something the government talks about a lot, what is our exit strategy from the current lockdown and social distancing measures? Mm -hmm. So certainly if a site has decided to close, it needs to keep that under quite, um, quite persistent review in order to decide when to open again. Um, and that can be a challenge to make sure that works. I can imagine, yeah. So uh, we do have a question from Jay Hensman, uh, which says, if force majeure clause is going to be difficult to use, is there a better clause in the standard JCT contract that should be called upon or to make sure clients don't remove as part of their standard amendments? Yeah, so the standard construction contracts have the concept of an extension of time rather than necessarily using the language force majeure. Now, I'll caveat this answer with I'm not a construction lawyer myself, um, but obviously it is a, a question we've been asked a lot. And we do have a construction specific um, guide on our website and also a construction specific webinar, which goes through the standard forms of contracts, which, again, you can download for free from there. Um, The extension of time provisions in the JCT contracts have the challenge that they literally only provide for an extension of time. So there isn't any cost protection sitting around that. So certainly that is an area where we have found the parties having more informed discussion in order to try and um, reach an appropriate landing point on on what that looks like um, across the whole of the project, because it's not normally one contract on the project that's affected, whereas it might be in a normal extension of time scenario, um, but more broadly across the whole project. And therefore, an employer needs to think about how they manage that on an ongoing basis. The other question we've been asked a lot on the construction side is around concurrent delay, which is um, typically a big issue in construction. And how do you prove that the delay you're experiencing or the costs you're experiencing are related to COVID-19 and not a delay you were going to incur in any event? And that essentially comes down to an evidential issue um, of keeping a relevant audit trail of why you believe you're impacted by COVID-19. Um, And certainly if you have suppliers sending you force majeure notices, that could help with that. If it's staff sickness, then again, keeping a clear record of that will help you evidence um, that you are being impacted by COVID-19 and not by broader um, risks of why the project might have been delayed in any event. Brilliant. Thank you. And thank you for that question. A couple of other questions from from my side. You know, we talked about corporate considerations and you talked about a virtual AGM, which sounds really interesting. Mm. I mean, 
could you see any of these measures becoming embedded in everyday business post post COVID nineteen? Is it something that you think that will become more and more apparent as 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 we emerge from this crisis? Yeah, fantastic question. So. I am a believer that necessity is the mother of invention. Um, and I really would like to see personally um, lots of things that have come out of COVID-19 go into everyday life. I think there are things like working from home, you know, businesses um, have been doing it to some extent for some time, but really playing around the edges for a lot of businesses. They had to go virtual overnight. Do you know what? It worked. Um, so I think there's lots of people now saying, well, I could work from home more often and I'd like my employer to support me with that. So it's a great opportunity for us to learn from this crisis and embed those new ways of working. And I think uh, virtual AGMs is another really good example of where we ought to embrace this and it is we're going to have to try and test them. Um, and if they all work, why not have that as a way going forward? We it fits into the whole climate change agenda. We can travel less, um, bring together people more virtually. The technology is there and is is being proved and tested when under significant strain on the networks and it is yeah. working. So some of the fears that people have had for, for leaping into these types of things are being immediately eradicated overnight, which I think is one of the really exciting things about COVID-19. Yeah, you mentioned the climate change agenda. I mean, oh God, you know, the, the, the strain on the transport network we see day to day, uh, be, yeah. you know, before the crisis started. And now the difference completely, not just in terms of air, air pollution levels, but uh, yeah. traffic flows as well. It'll be interesting to see um, how that develops post, post-crisis. Um, I mean, I had a couple of other questions, just again, just to touch upon some of the, the points you made in your presentation. Um, wrongful trading. What constitutes mm-hmm. wrongful trading? So, for example, I was thinking... Say if you've got someone who's taking deliveries of of materials and goods whilst knowing the company is unable to make payments for them, I presume that would be classed as wrongful trading. Yeah, if you could suspend those deliveries rather than taking them, then then that's probably the right thing to do. Um, However, if you choose uh, not to pay people because it's for the benefit of the wider creditor class and that will give Mm -hmm. you the cash flow to trade through until you access or draw down government support, then that may well be a justified decision. So I think it's taking it in the context of the overall um, business, but very much focusing on how will you get the best return for your creditors? So those you owe the money or the obligations to. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, I'm just checking to see if we've got any further questions from our participants. Um, I don't think we have at this stage. So uh, we're going to finish up shortly. So, um, Claire, one thing for me is if there's anything you'd like uh, people on this webinar to take away, what would it be? Oh, no, that's a good question. Um, so I think there are there are so many legal issues that flow from COVID-19. But for me, it's about doing the right thing for your business and making sure that you do um, what is right morally and and legally to see you out the other side with a strong and healthy business. If that means your business is of the nature that it needs to close, then thinking about what you can be doing to plan and prepare and make sure you have a really good strategy in place for coming out the other side. Some of that could be thinking about how you would invest in technology or how you um, change your business model or learn from COVID-19, as we've just talked about. But the more businesses that can come out strong the other side, the better it will be for for all of us um, in the business community as we um, come through COVID-19 successfully. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Claire. I think we're pretty much out of time. So, Claire, thank you so much for that presentation and the Q&A. It was really helpful. Thank you to everyone who, who joined uh, the, the webinar today. Um, as we said, if you've got any further questions, if you want to uh, follow up on any points, we will be sharing the, um, the presentation and we will also be sharing the content from uh, today's event on YouTube. So please do have a look at our, our um, uh, chamber page on YouTube. Um, from our perspective, as we mentioned, there's a number of webinars taking place next week. Um, so please do have a look at our website for more information. Um, All that's left for me to say is have a great Easter weekend and please stay safe and we'll hope to see you soon. Thank you very much, everyone. Goodbye.